them in real time. From that company, I pulled out my development team and set up an R&D lab, EDX. I called it EDX Labs. We have already launched two more platforms in Bahrain, and we are starting another startup in Saudi. Uh, maybe another time for another type of discussion, I can explain to you why and what I'm doing. Uh, but for today's subject, I'm, I just added this slide while I was listening to the talk of Kirti that all about AI and as well as when Amin was talking and especially the last comment from Amin that data is what will make and break the company. We are at a very exciting time right now. You know, human progress had been sort of linear. We have gone through three digital transformations in the past, but this one, which we is the fourth industrial revolution is going to really change the whole concept, the whole human society, the fabric, the way we live. And it's already making the change and COVID has only what they did is that it made us push towards that new horizon uh, where we were may have been sort of resistant to it in the past. Like today we are having this talk through an online platform. Uh, before I used to travel every week somewhere for a meeting and it was happening with my business for the last 15, 16 years. And this is the first year that I haven't traveled really for anywhere for business. We can so easily do all these calls so the acceptability is also there. Now, my today's subject is all about cybersecurity and how AI would be playing a role in cybersecurity. Uh, I would like to first go through some of the challenges to say that why we can leverage and what we can leverage. And then we will talk about some aspects of cybersecurity and how we can really change the way we do cybersecurity. And I have some specific point to mention in the end, how it is being done and how it should be done. I hope it will be of value to uh, the audience here. The ones who have listened to my talks, I always start with this, that to highlight or to uh, emphasize on the problem. This was an FBI director who said in 2012, there are only two type of companies, those who have been hacked and those who will be. So it was emphasizing a big problem that in 2012, but in 2016, the Cisco CEO, and now he's a chairman, he said that there are only two types of companies, those who, those who have been hacked and those who don't know who have been hacked. So from bad, we went to worse. The problem of cybersecurity keeps on growing. <clears throat> we are not able to really manage it. This is the most important part that this is a losing war. What we are doing is a losing war. Lately, the IBM CEO, uh, she said that we believe that data is a phenomenon of our time. It is the world's new natural resource as uh, Kerti was also mentioning and Amin was also mentioning, but it is a new basis of comparative advantage. At the same time, we need to look at it that it is becoming the greatest threat to every profession, every industry, every company in the world, the cyber crime part. Though we have on one side data and we can leverage and we can do all the business, but today the world has realized that the greatest threat to all of that is cybersecurity. And this is why cybersecurity is also on the agenda item for every board today. So if that is the important part, why are we losing this war? Why are we keep on losing so many battles when it comes to cybersecurity? Look at the losses. They just keep on growing exponentially, which itself is an indicator that we are not really able to do cybersecurity rightly. Um, more than half of the EU firms have been impacted in the last two years from cybersecurity incidents. The data which I'm showing you on the left hand, which is just how many billions of dollars are lost, which were monetary terms reported to IC3 within US only. <clears throat> Whereas if we try to look at the cost of cyber crime to the world, uh, this was a fact by World Economic Forum, which was saying that in the next two years, we will be losing about 
5.2 trillion dollars to cyber attacks and cyber crime. Now, all of this is very worrying when we look on how we want to leverage from technology on the other side. We are spending a lot of money on trying to secure ourselves. Every year, more money is being spent. This is market size just for the Europe, that how they are spending so much money and they will keep on spending more money on trying to secure organizations. So the question remains, when we are doing all these efforts, when we know all the problems, why we are not able to solve the problem? And in addition to all of what we are knowing, there are so many security vendors in the industry who are trying to give us solutions. And it is very confusing really. And, and I have been, now I am just a vendor and I'm building my own platform and selling that to my customers. But prior to that, I was representing a lot of big security vendors in the world. And each year I will go to my customers and tell them, you know what, here is a new technology, take that and this will solve the problem. And you know what, the problem kept on getting bigger. And every year we keep on going back to them and trying to sell them more and saying, this will solve the problem. But the problem is not being solved. And security teams within organizations keep on growing. Organizations keep on deploying more appliances and security products. There are more than 25,000 vendors who are giving you all of these security solutions. And these security solutions basically are trying to give you a cover across this kind of security layers within your organization. We have, this, this is just a concept which I used to be doing for my uh, customers that I'll go and tell them, here is a technology stack which you require in the company. We will have the SIM on the top, which is managing really all the security devices, which is looking across all the data which are being generated as events across security devices and computing devices and trying to identify and put them all together to see where the attacks are and what needs to be done. And this SIM is really also having under it the perimeter firewall, the network security appliances. Then we have other network devices doing threat hunting as well. We have application security, endpoint security, data security, and we have all the policy and procedures around it. We have regulators telling us what to do. So all of this security technology stack, the policy procedures around it, we are not yet able to really even manage the problem. Sorry to say, I am from that industry and I am failing to give my customers the right level of protection we need to be giving them. What is our approach? Our current approach is that we are doing defense in depth. It's like Fort Knox. The picture there on the screen is Fort Knox. Fort Knox has all the physical world gold there. And so many countries have their gold sitting there as well, not only the US. And it is being defended by, of course, there is the parameter security, there are detections, and there are physical guards there are layers of security. If you go past through the gate, you will be stopped at the uh, entrance. And if you go past through that, there are other security measures. If you even get to the vault, it has its own security measures. And that is what defense in depth is all about. But this is the one, our model, which we are already doing. And when we come to, from this physical world to the logical world, we are looking at indicators of compromise. So in this physical world, all these parameters which we had in Fort Knox, they're all trying to identify compromise and trying to mitigate it. But that would be called after an event has happened. This is why when I look at the security stack, which I showed you, and I look at that all of them are really working on indicators of compromise, to me, <clears throat> that is the problem itself. We are doing the security at a very late time. And then the way we do it, we're doing sort of blacklisting in the logical world. We're trying to find out what compromise happened somewhere else. And let me start looking for that type of compromise in my organization. 
This is what my device is majority of the time they are what they are doing. So this approach has to first change. This indicators of compromise, what are those which we are today doing really? We have all of these stack of technology inside the organization. We are looking for malicious URLs. We are looking for rogue IPs. We are looking for rogue domains, emails, malicious files. And as soon as we identify that, we are trying to block it. Yes, there has been some bit of a change where we're trying to use certain smartness where we are saying that let's do behavior based. But then again, it is like an indicator of behavior which you build into the technology to identify and block attacks. So this is the current scenario, how we are doing sort of management of the cybersecurity for our organizations. Now the challenges, the first challenge we have when we are doing with that model is also to know what is threat intelligence? Because all of those IOCs with which I'm trying to block an intruder inside my organization, I need to understand that that alone is not threat intelligence. If I look at the threat intelligence uh, definition, uh, which is uh, given by the UK CERT, they are looking at it as that it is, they're saying that it is an elusive concept itself. And it is driven by comparative imperatives, meaning that if I'm a vendor, I go around and try to say what I am doing is really providing you the right threat intelligence and this is how you're supposed to do your cybersecurity. Again, in my humble view, that's the wrong approach. Threat intelligence is much more than this. So first thing, a first challenge which we should be solving through AI is this aspect. I want to go a little more detail in that. Threat intelligence model, this is a good model done by MWR Info Security, which was later bought by another uh, company. And this shows you that threat intelligence has four aspects, the strategic, the tactical, the technical, and the operational. Strategic is where the board is looking at cybersecurity and they're making some uh, policy decisions and strategy decisions and tactical is where the architects and system admins are looking at the techniques and tools being used by the attackers and they are building their they're supposed to be building their secure uh, systems built in to manage that kind of threats then we have the current indicators of I call it the indicators of exposure and indicators of compromise that the SOC staff, staff has to look at. But that indicators of exposure, the terminology I just used, is currently not really being used by the security industry. Then we have the operational security where we should be looking at indicators of warning and indicators of attack. And you know what? If you go and Google it, you will not find current cybersecurity using this aspect of operational security. So there is already a lot of lack which we have when it comes to threat intelligence, the way we are doing cybersecurity today. Another challenge we have, which I see from all the time I have been in cybersecurity from last more than about 23, 24 years is configuration management. So when we are putting in our infrastructure we have systems, we have operating systems, we have all the infrastructure devices. Everything needs to be configured. And this configuration are the individuals who are sitting and doing that configuration. And this is so insecure, why? Because the whole process of this security configuration is being done by people. It's not really automated even. And we end up keeping it so that we leave always the holes in it. One of the things which we always see in security, when we talk about threats or attack surface from outside, we see that organizations leave a lot of injection vulnerability. This SQL injection or any other injection vulnerability is there because you're not able to really manage the configuration of your systems. This also happens inside within your desktops. And in fact, if I ask uh, on this, uh, all the audience who is there, how many of you have 
broadband at your home, almost everybody. How many of you have ever looked at the configuration of your routers? I think none. Nobody has looked at the configuration of the router. It is in default mode and it is very insecure. Not only that it is making all the people who are inside the house using the, their devices are being insecure because of that, but also it allows attackers, rogue actors to use your devices and attack somebody else through that. So your own router could be doing cyber attacks on somebody else and you don't know because you never looked at the configuration of your router. Uh, the other point, which a challenge which we have is really the vulnerability management. Why are the systems vulnerable in the first place? You know, all this technology which we are building, there is this never ending, this is why it's cyclic. It's a never ending race or never ending challenge. Every week, Microsoft announces so many patches. Every week, Cisco announces patches. All vendors are announcing packages. Uh, uh, and they are all providing all the patches and updates in security products as well. Why is this happening? This is, a, this is not at all the right way of putting uh, technology out there where we continuously need to be patching it. This vulnerability patch is a big challenge. All organizations, I know if any of my audience is from the bigger organizations where they have got multiple systems inside the organization. How do you go around patching it? And forget at home, the home routers and stuff. Nobody has ever patched it. So this is why we are losing the cybersecurity war. Now, top it all with the human part. We are expecting people to be doing a lot of secure practices. We ask people not to click on links. We ask people to remember so many passwords. That is the wrong approach to me. That is not right. We are humans, don't expect. We will be not doing it perfect all the time. So we become as individuals the weakest link in cybersecurity. So why isn't something out there already being done where in this cybersecurity puzzle, we take the humans out of it. We don't depend on people to do it. We have machines, we have computing power, we have AI that should be solving this problem. And now we have a much bigger spectrum. We have IoT devices, internet. There are so many things in the house now which are connected to internet. The car is connected to an internet. Industry is connected to an internet. The watch you are wearing could be connected to an, and there are so many smart watches already out there. The clothes which you wear are connected to the internet. Internet of things is just going up and up and up. There would be estimated that around 41.6 billion connected devices will be generating like 79.4 zettabytes of data in 2025. So not only that we are not able to solve the cybersecurity problem. Look at the amount of new devices which will be coming in. So we cannot keep on doing cybersecurity the way we are doing it. We need to change. And the change has to happen now, not later. The world is moving very fast. We can't leave things to chance. We have to change now, because if we don't, it is in a way we are leaving things to chance. And if we leave things to chance, if we look at the history, it's a losing war. Every year, losses grow exponentially. And suddenly, we will have one day a tsunami of problems because of cybersecurity. And this pandemic, which we have, would look nothing in front of what we may have a pandemic of a cyber issue. So, how do we start looking at the problem? We have to solve it with a different mindset. Now this has to be understood right. How do we change our mindset when we look at a problem and how to solve a problem? I'll give you this through an example. Look at this picture. What do you see? You see a tree. This is not a tree. 
This is nature's solar panel. This is the way if you want to make electricity, go put two wires on the tree and get power from it. This is how you transform. We have to look at the same thing, but very in a very different manner. When we talk about cybersecurity, and I told you defense in depth, we have to also think of offensive defense. We have to think of identifying the problems at the root and trying to min eliminate at their root. When we you do that and we bring in artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is a double-edged sword. Keep in mind, whatever we do, however we use it for the purpose of securing ourselves, the same thing could be used by the attackers. And they, are, they could be one step ahead of us. So we have to do it in the right manner and fast. How do we use artificial intelligence today? And I, my way is a little different, I'll tell you that. The way it is being done is that we are using artificial intelligence like in the SIM, the first layer. SIM is our security event and incident management system. And that is supposed to be correlating a lot of data which is being generated inside an organization and identify attacks and come up and give the power to or give the value to the threat analyst who's sitting and managing a SOC security operation center in real time to block attacks. But that, when you bring in AI, you're taking away the people and you're optimizing the SIM. Now, and this is good, nothing wrong, which is good because humans, we can make mistakes. Humans cannot work at the speed of the computer to identify or correlate incidents. And this is already being done. So we have an intelligent SIM, which is using AI. We also are using AI in firewalls. Look at the date of the first paper, which was written of AI in firewall in 2011. And only in 2018 and 19, we started having the firewall products out there. There are already some vendors who are providing you firewalls with AI. And Huawei is one of them, by the way. Uh, then we have the endpoint security. Think of it today. The way it's being done is that in the endpoint security, we have got uh, agents security agents by McAfee or uh, Trend Micro or some other security vendor, which is looking and identifying and blocking malicious code. And we still tell the users don't click on a link because you may download a malicious code which the machine may not recognize. Now with AI, that endpoint security will change. With AI, the machine will be smart enough to know which is a malicious code, and we don't have to tell the users, don't click, go ahead, click, do whatever. The machine is smart enough. If it is a malicious code, it will identify and block it. We also have AI um, on authentication. You know, one of the worst things which I have is passwords. I just don't like passwords. You know, I can't remember today, even before this, uh, meeting, uh, I was trying to reset one of the passwords, which I forgot because I haven't used it from a long time. And this is a big problem. Why do we go around using passwords all the time and we expect people to remember it? And there are tons of passwords. Anything we do, we have to have an authentication. So where is AI helping us out? There are also solutions coming in that will help us out with uh, the passwords. There are many companies right now who are taking all of those technologies, all the layers of the technologies which I showed you, and they are improving on it, and they're bringing in AI, enabling it or optimizing it, I call it. Remember, I showed you a while back this picture and I said, think differently. So whatever up till now I have shown you, it is not really thinking differently. It is doing what we were doing before, but using computers to do it. Where is the different thing? What do I mean by that? The best way I can explain to you that is by looking at something which I call FinTech versus Tech Fin. Today, when a bank is optimizing using technology, using e-banking, using saying, you know, we have a, a branchless banking or you walk into a kiosk and you can do all your banking, that's, that is optimization. Whereas if you transfer, 
you're using digital wallets. A technology company like Facebook, like um, Alibaba, they become a bank by using digital wallets or like STC Pay, which is really not a bank and became a bank using, uh, giving you digital wallets, transformed the whole concept, what was being done. Now, just for the same understanding, because that's the most important point if we really want to address security rightly is, here is another piece like when uh, Henry Ford, he came up with his first uh, steam powered car. Uh, that was when he was talking, when he said was that if I would have asked the people, they would ask, they would have said they need faster horses. Transformation was remove the horses and bring in some car where people can go around and uh, really be transforming themselves into this new technology. Same thing happens to the farming. There is now urban farming happening so many places. I know Amal, I'm behind just two minutes. Okay. Uh, and same thing happens in medical science. We think that we can replace the doctors and the doctors can come in with computers. We'll do the diagnosis. Yes, Google AI has done an excellent job where they can look at the X-ray much better or MRI much better and with higher accuracy. But the transformation is not that. Transformation is that in our body, nanobots will be running around and we don't need to go and do these scans anymore and they will be fixing us. This is what is needed also in cybersecurity. We don't need a firewall. We don't need a SIM. We don't need all of that. We don't need endpoint security. We need every single device, be it your phone, be it your router, to be intelligent and have built-in security. And talk to everybody else at the same time from the security side. So it's a completely different transformation of thinking about security. Now, this aspect of security, there are people who are looking into it and trying to develop it. It's happening so, sort of, I call it in a parallel world, but the way the current cybersecurity is enhancing, it is good, it is optimization, but what has to happen is transformation. And that hopefully with time will happen. Thank you. I hope my talk was useful. Sorry, Amal.